In the desolate, fog-shrouded foothills of the Grey Peak Mountains is a dead-end canyon known as Deadstone Cleft. It contains the petrified bodies of stone giants embedded in its hundred-foot-tall gray walls. Deadstone Cleft is the remote canyon lair of a xenophobic clan of stone giants who worship scorious stone bones. If the characters defeat the zealous stone giant leader, Thane Kyolithica, and obtain her conch of teleportation, they can use it to teleport to Maelstrom. Hello everyone, I'm Alex, and today we are going to discuss Chapter 6 of Storm King's Thunder, Canyon of the Stone Giants. Unlike most stone giants, Thane Kyolithica is a neutral evil extremist. She is using the disillusion of the Ordning as an excuse to destroy what she has come to fear and loathe. The rapidly spreading civilizations of humans. Kyolithica's followers only believe that violence against the small folk is justified because their Thane has assured them that they are heeding the will of their god. Kyolithica believes that the works of the small folk are a pox on the land. They desecrate the very stone upon they are built. By obliterating them, she hopes to impress the gods and elevate her people to the top of the Ordning. By the time adventurers set a course for her canyon, Kyolithica has already led major assaults on the nearby settlements of Olbar and Lokth. The stone giant Thane now has her sights set on Loudwater or Parnast, and she has asked Scoria's Stonebones to send her divine guidance about which community to attack next. Not all members of Kyolithica's clan support the Thane. A few have fled into the nearby mountains and foothills, fearing that Deadstone Cleft has become a cursed place. These stone giants won't easily be turned against their Thane, but they might be persuaded to help adventurers survive the perils of Deadstone Cleft by providing information about the canyon and its defenses. They can also shed light on Kyolithica's evil intentions. Deadstone Cleft is sacred to the stone giants of the Grey Peak Mountains, for it contains an ancient temple dedicated to their god, Scorious Stone Bones, and a magical stalactite, the Steinfang, into which the giants carve questions. The carvings fade on nights of the new moon and are replaced with answers. The giants believe that these replies come from Scorious Stone Bones himself, though in truth they are produced by an ancient evil earth primordial trapped under the Grey Peak Mountains since the dawn of time. Humans and dwarven miners have long avoided the canyon for fear of antagonizing the stone giants known to dwell inside. The stone giants don't tolerate uninvited guests into their hollowed halls, attacking them on sight. Adventurers can find the canyon by traveling upstream along an arm of the Lower Grand River. This great river once carved the canyon out of the rock that now surrounds it. Time has reduced it to a stream that tumbles along the canyon floor before widening and continuing its long journey southwest, where it merges with the Delambure River on its way to the sea. Billowing clouds of mist lightly obscure Deadstone Cleft, the location of which is ultimately betrayed by the moaning wind that passes through it, a haunting dirge that can be heard up to a quarter mile away. Guarding the mouth of the canyon is a rock that the stone giants have tamed. I highly recommend that the party makes the majority of the journey to Deadstone Cleft on the ground for two reasons. One is that the rock will no doubt bring the airship to the ground, which can be a devastating loss for you and your party. The second is that many of the locations near the canyon have immense world building that I think add a lot to the stone giant's part in the story. A simple way to deter parties from making an approach by air is warning them about the rock that guards the canyon. The rock would likely use the valley beneath the Grey Peak Mountains as its hunting ground, and could threaten the party in the airship anywhere in that location. If the stone giants are the first lair your party is facing, Harshnag could easily provide this warning, ensuring the party leaves the airship in Loudwater or another location outside the valley. If the party is visiting the remaining giant lairs later in the adventure, Hecaton could provide this warning instead. If your party is still bold enough to bring the airship into the Vale, I recommend that the rock spots it during one of its hunting excursions right outside the ruins of Olbar. It targets the balloon as the book suggests, and as soon as it brings the airship down, it flees back to the canyon. This ensures you will have control over how the party enters the dungeon. It can also be possible for them to repair the airship afterwards. More on that later. Zelbras, Lorkth, Olbar, and Loudwater are all great springboards for the dungeon and the party can learn valuable information at each location. Loudwater is a location the party is most likely to visit as early as Chapter 3, since it contains a Harper teleportation circle. However, no quests from Chapter 2 bring the party anywhere close. If the party visits Loudwater, it would be bursting at the seams with refugees from the nearby settlements, as described in the book. This helps the players get a sense of urgency, and makes the threats the giants create seem more real and connected to the world. 
Old Bear and Lulk have great encounters. While it is much more likely the party will pass to Old Bear, if you prefer the encounter at Lulk, you can easily swap them. If your party has not had a combat with Stone Giants yet, consider using the Lorkth encounter. You could always have the non-hostile Stone Giant from the Old Bar encounter be somewhere in the valley, hurting his goats across the expanse. Finally, Zelbros has an amazing encounter where the party can meet a child of the Blue Bear tribe. I highly recommend you move the ruins of the Sly Fox to the town of Old Bar instead, or any area that the party passes through. The child, Oruk, can be a great bargaining ship with the Blue Bear Barbarians the party will encounter later in the dungeon. The party has traversed the valley of the Great Peak Mountains and arrived at the canyon. Don't forget to describe the moaning wind the canyon creates as they begin to get close. When the players arrive at the canyon mouth, the rock spots them unless they take an active attempt to remain hidden, which could be difficult in the wide open. The battle with the rock attracts the attention of Hydea Moonmusk, the daughter of the Blue Bear tribe Chiefess and also the only real mini-boss of the dungeon. She has come to Deadstone Cleft to ally herself and her followers with Thane Kyolithica, as the Blue Bear tribe shared the belief that the civilization is a blight on the land. Hydea emerges from the cave if there are any disturbances outside, and sticks her two adult bears on any foes. She herself immediately retreats with the bear cub into the canyon to gather reinforcements. Use the rock to cover any attempts made by players to pursue her. If the party attempts to sneak inside, at the very least contest stealth by the rock's passive perception. Keep in mind if they don't conceal themselves in some way, stealth would be completely impossible and the rock would spot them automatically. But if the party is creative enough to slip by, the most likely place they will go first is into the bear cave. There, Hydea can make a similar play as above and attempt to retreat outside as soon as possible, using the bears as a means to escape. Once outside the cave, she immediately beckons the rock, which then rolls initiative. The rock blocks the entrance to the cave and pursues anyone who attempts to chase after her. If the party sneaks past the rock and doesn't enter the bear cave, you could move Hydea into another location inside, or reward the players and allow them to catch the barbarians by surprise. Hydea could pursue the players throughout the dungeon in this situation and attack at an opportune moment. Ideally, Hydea is able to flee and alert the other barbarians to the intruder's presence. They are underwhelming if challenged into small groups, so them being assembled is really the only way to pose any real threat to the party. The assembled barbarian party should patrol the canyon, searching for the intruders and making it difficult for parties to pass from one half of the dungeon to the other without attracting attention. The party is most likely to enter the cave closest to the bear cave once the rock has been dealt with, which should attempt to flee before it dies. Which is great, because a couple of choice rooms are in store ahead. The darkness and sinister vibe of the canyon will deter most parties from entering there. The first real challenge is the giant guarding the room containing the pit of Gorgon Mud. He has gained the benefits of Olak Mora. A stone giant of Deadstone Cleft can enter a meditative state that leaves it petrified for a time. When the petrification ends, the giant awakens with tremor sense and the ability to cast a handful of spells. Stone giants refer to the petrified state as Olak Mora, which translates as the Great Stillness. So this giant hiding in the wall attempts to surprise the party by pushing whoever is leading the party into the mud when they round the corner from the previous chamber. Hopefully, the character leading the party is a strong tanky type, so they have the best odds of not being shoved in. Keep in mind, the pit functions as quicksand, which means as soon as characters fall in, they sink 1d4 plus 1 feet and become restrained. At the beginning of their turn, they sink another 1d4 feet. The difficulty check to escape is 10 plus the number of feet they are submerged, and you can only make that escape check if you are not completely submerged. A few unlucky rolls could spell disaster for a member of the party, so try to avoid shoving in halflings and gnomes, as they could become completely submerged almost instantly. If a character ends their turn in the mud, they must also make a con save difficulty check 12 or become petrified. If the worst happens and a member of the party becomes petrified and sinks to the bottom of the pool, don't fret. While stone giants aren't inherently immune to petrification, it stands to say they have a much better chance of surviving the perils of the pit. Likewise, they would probably be able to simply reach into the pit and pluck a petrified character out. You could also just grant the giants immunity to petrification if they are under the effects of Olak Mora. The players may encounter non-hostile giants later in the dungeon and could petition for their assistance. Likewise, they could threaten a giant close to death to rescue their fallen companion. Of course, being removed from the pit does not cure the petrification. 
If the party lacks significant magic to reverse the effect, they may have to seek out a more powerful spellcaster and provide payment. In the next room with the two hidden giants, there is a trap that spits characters out into the pool in the previous chamber. If a character with less than desirable stats or of short stature steps onto the trap, maybe choose to ignore it, or perhaps use this as an opportunity to let fate tamper with your game. The characters will probably cross the bridge around this time. If Heidi escaped earlier, she would have gathered her barbarians at this point, especially if the party chooses to rest in the dungeon or decided to spend time to search the rooms in the previous chamber. She should be about halfway down the canyon at this point, and would no doubt spot characters who make no attempts to conceal themselves when they cross the bridge. If the party has Auric, the barbarian child with them, and offers to return him to his tribe, they may be able to bargain with Hydea to turn her attitude from hostile to indifferent, allowing the party to pass but refusing any other assistance. But ultimately that is up to you, as the book suggests nothing of the sort. Once the party kill, sneak, or persuade the barbarians, they will probably continue across the bridge, or enter the back part of the dungeon. Maybe they entered through the canyon's mouth and went towards the rock's nest earlier, which may have caused them to intercept Hydea in the gathering cave, assembling her tribe. This dungeon is a web, and the likelihood of the party being predictable goes down significantly. But across the bridge lies two more snow giants. Depending on if the party short-rested at this point, they may be meditating or in an extended petrified slumber. The gathering cave ahead might be either empty or full of barbarians, but regardless, I would consider this the most likely place the party would end up at some point, no matter which entry point they take, which in turn would lead them to Kyolithica. I do have a couple more areas I would like to discuss quickly, but most other areas can be run as written and provide more flavor and content to explore. If the characters find themselves in Area 7, they can encounter Skod Kong's tomb. This tomb functions as a mini oracle, but has the added benefit of being truthful and all-knowing. An important thing to note is that only one character can think of and ask the questions, and has a time limit to come up with something. Be sure to take the player aside, as the book suggests, or simply inform the other party members that they can provide no assistance and time them. After a minute of no questions, they are expelled, but of course another character can give it a try. The party will probably think of short-term questions on the spot, but they may surprise you with a plot-related question they have been sitting on since the first Oracle visit. Areas 10, 11, and 12, and the back barbarian caves, as well as the two non-hostile giants at the end of the canyon, are all satisfactory encounters. Just read carefully, and they should go well. I especially enjoy the giant in Area 10, and the two non-hostile giants at the back of the canyon. Your party has stumbled into the canyon's temple, a sacred location to the stone giants of Deadstone Cleft. Here they will find Thane Kyolithica, carving questions into the Steinfang. As mentioned earlier, the stone giants are driven by the answers given to them by the magical stalactite, and as long as it persists, it will be a plague on the valley and continue to drive future Thanes to commit atrocities. When the characters enter the chamber, Kyolithica should immediately feel their presence, as she is the only one permitted to enter this room, and any changes in the air would become apparent to her instantly, due to her attunement to the room itself. When the party enters, she makes herself known and pledges to end their existence, as the party has disrespected her title by entering the chamber, and has, no doubt, committed many atrocities against her people to get this far uninhibited. Allow the characters to gather in one of the respective areas, depending on which way they entered. Kyolithica then points to the fossilized stone giant closest to the party, causing it to animate, casts stone skin on herself, and rolls initiative along with her golem. Kyolithica attacks the party in cover, behind the Steinfang by launching thin stalactites as the party approaches and attacks her golem. As the book suggests, as soon as she is targeted with ranged attacks, she uses her next action to cast Meld into Stone and enter the Steinfang until the characters approach. You may have her exit again during a later round, which only uses movement, and attack again, only to re-enter again on a later round if the characters are taking a while to approach. If the stone golem is defeated, I suggest that Kyolithica cause another one to animate on her turn. The book says she may only do this once, but I believe it keeps the fight interesting, especially for stronger parties if the golem is a continuous threat until the Thane is defeated. If you wish, you could even give Kyolithica a layer action instead, having one of them be pointing to a stone golem to animate it, and the other causing a piercer to fall from the ceiling, like the giant in Area 10. I would imagine she can only animate one golem at a time. Once the players get to the top of the island, Kyolithica is now within melee range if she exits the Steinfang. Keep in mind, for characters approaching from the east entrance, they will have to go up the ramp to get to the top of the island, unless they make an athletics check specified in the dungeon sidebar. If one of the golems still lives, she may not want to exit the Steinfang immediately, and could continue to wait or harass the party from above for as long as possible. 
For stronger parties confronting her later in the game, the ideal strategy should be to coerce the party into attacking the Steinfang so it explodes and causes massive damage to anyone waiting for her to emerge. Either way, once she emerges and begins fighting with her great club, she should aim to target weaker characters who are near the island's edge. If she drops below half health, she uses her time stop. While in time stop, she can cast stone shape as many times as she is able to cause slabs of rock to fall from the ceiling on top of party members as soon as time resumes. She also attempts to shove any character who is close enough to the edge of the island with her final turn after using time stop. Hopefully she is able to put up a good fight. As the book suggests, any animated stone golems crumble to dust when she is defeated. Kyalithica has some interesting loot on her person, most notably an entire individual by the name of Alistair. Alistair is a great addition to the party's lineup, as he is a priest and an intelligent inventor, and can provide the players with some backstory in depth on the stone giant's activities if they missed any of that information. He also rewards the party for saving him with a clock and by offering his services, impressed by their remarkable airship. He is so impressed that the book suggests that he and his construct companion steal the airship the first time they are left alone on it. I suggest having Alistair complain about the other crew the airship possesses, which should be easy if there are still the dragon cultists. Alistair would be familiar with the cult of the dragon, as they recently tried to summon Tiamat and destroy the world as we know it. He would have good reason to be distrustful of the cultists, and would suggest to the party that he and his construct could pilot the airship without them. If the party agrees and gives the cultists the boot, then Alistair would be able to make his escape with the airship the next time the party enters a dungeon or town. If you want to run this encounter but don't wish to see the airship lost, perhaps allow the party an opportunity to catch up with Alistair in Loudwater as he gathers supplies from his shop and loads them onto the airship. Another idea is to simply forget about this ulterior motive of Alistair and allow him to join the party no strings attached. Side note, if the airship's balloon was destroyed earlier, Alistair seems like a prime candidate to assist the party with repairs. Kyalithica, of course, also has her conch of teleportation on her person. With the evil Thane of Deadstone Cleft defeated, the players can finally claim it and use it to get to Maelstrom, and the next stage of the adventure. Well, that is the video. I hope you enjoyed it, and make sure to check back for the next giant lair, the Burg of the Frost Giants. Thanks for watching.